Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Saki, and we are still on site at the American Anthropological Association's annual meeting. We are now blessed to be sitting down with Dr. Graham Pruss. Hello there. How are you doing, man? I'm great, how are you? Thanks for coming on to the show. Thanks so much for having me, it's a pleasure. Greatly appreciate it. Really excited to be talking about what you care about. Let's give a background on Graham. Graham is a PhD candidate at the University of Washington. He's working on the Vehicle Residency Project, which we will be unpacking in tons of nuance. Really excited about that. And he's the executive director and co-founder at WeCount.org. Check out the link in the bio. We'll be talking about that as well. It's a system that helps communities request and donate items for people in need that need social services. And it helps with assisting homeless get off the streets. Graham is also a... Uh, a National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellow, and he also has a lot of very interesting thoughts about uh, applying practice, practical thinking to anthropology, and just in general, um, I'm really excited to break down uh, your 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 what you're focused on right, right now, what you care about. But even before we get to that, let's talk about you and how you even got here. So mm. how, who were you as a kid and how did you get interested in anthropology? Uh, well, let's see, so I was a, uh, you know, I, I grew up in that kind of, you know, upper middle class uh, American uh, suburbs here actually in, in San Jose. Uh, and I, uh, you know, by the time I was, a, uh, as, a, as a youth, I had traveled a lot with my parents around the country in an RV and my grandparents were retiree snowbirds. And, and so, uh, you know, doing those frugal family trips, you know, uh, wherever we could was often in a vehicle. Um, and then, uh, and then as I grew older and became a, a, a punk rocker and sort of a, uh, often a kind of a contrarian with my uh, community around me, I didn't feel like I fit in a lot. And so I, uh, you know, I, I started you know, not doing as well in school, ended up failing out of high school um, and, uh, and actually became homeless uh, at the age of 15. Uh, lived on the streets of uh, San Jose, of Berkeley and San Francisco, uh, in parks and under bridges and in vehicles, if, if I was lucky, in a, a, a girlfriend's vehicle at the time, um, or in the back of punk rock clubs where I worked security <laughs> often. <laughs> and uh, and so, so I did that, um, so, I, so I had experienced homelessness and, then, and a, uh, after several months a, a person at a community meal offered me a quarter to help me to contact my parents and that was the catalyst that uh, helped me to really you know, connect with my society and, and my future. Uh, I was able to retake my classes, graduate from high school, uh, but I had my son at 18, even even after that, and, uh, and wasn't you know able to go to college or anything. So I'm actually sort of a late bloomer in a lot of this. I uh, a lot of my work is based upon real world applications because it's the life I lived. Um, I uh, uh, having a son at 18, I spent years in social service offices uh, on welfare, getting medical coupons for the birth of him, uh, our son, and, and housing coupons to keep housed and sheltered. Uh, and I sort of learned what it was like to stand in lines waiting to get the assistance that you need so desperately to survive. Uh, and so when it came, to when I had the opportunity to go to school myself uh, in my 30s, uh, I was able to transfer into the University of Washington. Uh, I worked with uh, Jason DeLeon, who I believe you spoke with earlier, uh, uh, when uh, as an undergraduate, uh, and uh, was able to actually go to field school with him uh, during the Undocumented Migration Project. Mm -hmm. That was in 2010, so it was early on in, in the in the project. I think it was the second year of the field school, and. When I came back from that field school, I was rip raring to go. I was, you know, really impassioned. I knew I wanted to do important work that was compelling, was meaningful, uh, and that for me had a, a deeper connection, um, much like Jason's work is with, with him. And, and so I, um, uh, I, I had actually been bartending by this point in a community in Seattle known as Ballard, uh, mm -hmm. which is in North Seattle and is a traditionally uh, blue collar sort of fishing and shipwright industry place. And I knew a lot of people who were living in their vans and their RVs and who, you know, I had, had was serving in my bar and they were, you know, I'd see them sitting on the other side of the bar mm. day after day, night after night. And I'd say, you know, and, and, and then come to learn that they lived in their vehicle. And it really challenged my own preconceived notions around homelessness mm -hmm. um, based on my own experiences and what I had seen around me. Now this was mm -hmm. 20 years later after I had experienced homelessness. So I had mm -hmm. developed a lot of the biases that many people have around homelessness. And, and, and I think that it, uh, it was that 
challenging of my own notions that pushed me to get into this work. Um, so I started to, uh, to, to get into vehicle residency and, just, and, and, um, and research vehicle residency. We could talk a little bit more about that yeah. momentarily, but uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much how we got there. Whoa, so it's crazy that you had a experience yourself at 15 mm -hmm. of having to figure out streets, street life, mm -hmm. because that in itself is a, <clears throat> that makes a man real quick. Mm. It, it, uh, I don't even know. I, you know, I would say there's a certain amount of arrested development that comes from it too. You know, to be yeah. honest, I see a lot of the world through my 15 year old eyes still. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's difficult, uh, because it does, it, I think it, it's, um, Experiencing highly traumatic uh, uh, life uh, firsthand and secondarily that you see when you're on the streets, not just you know from the experiences that you have yourself, but what you see around you, really, um, it does have a, a lasting effect. And I, I think that uh, for myself and many of the people who I know who've also experienced homelessness, it often leaves this deeper kind of sense of passion uh, towards social inequality, uh, towards um, under, you know, um, thinking about what it means around identity and about uh, identities that are, are, are positioned on top of people, about you know, when you spend enough time on a street corner asking for change and you see hundreds and thousands of people walking by trying to ignore you, it, it really does, um, I think, uh, f force a different perspective on what it means to be a member of our society, to occupy public space, uh, and to try to get by. You know, <laughs> and so I, I mean, really, I think that's that for me, that was, uh, uh, I think I, I'm very, I consider myself very privileged for, for being able to have that experience because it allows me to um, think about those things at that sort of more problematic way. Um, I contest the notion of, even of what it means to be homeless, you know, and, and, and that kind of they versus we, you know, and I, the way that I see I've come to see this, uh, these, these ex experiences of social suffering is that they are social experiences, that things that we all participate in, uh, that we all experience, we all feel from the cost of that person, uh, uh, the cost of the social services from that person, the cost of uh, 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 reintegrating that person in society, the cost of uh, the loss of productivity, that ultimately I see that um, for myself, the reason why I'm able to do this work was because somebody reached out and offered me a quarter. And uh, that small catalyst that helped to make my change, which is part of the reason why we developed We Count as well, uh, is uh, what brought my potential back to the table. And I think about all the potential that we leave off the table when we don't address how we can help stabilize our neighbors. Uh, and how we can provide spaces for people to connect with, you know, what's going to help them to um, to be active parts of our society. Yeah, the quarter as a catalyst for you to figure things out in your life is crazy. That the smallest sort of tiniest butterfly effects can That's exactly right. can go like that. And then also when you're talking about the 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 we the we versus the them or the they's the us versus the they's this the this is something that we've had the chance to talk about a little bit and even you know before we get into the nuance of the vehicle residency project just speaking on that when you're on a when you're on a corner and you're asking for assistance um, you mentioned this earlier there's a lot of these preconceived beliefs or notions about what the person, who the person is, why mm -hmm. they're there, mm -hmm. all this kind of stuff. But we've had the chance to sit down with people on our show that live on the streets or we've talked to them on the streets as well. And um, a lot of times uh, they've had serious traumatic family experiences that have led them to the point yeah. where their parents are addicts or their parents aren't there. They live in right multiple dozens of foster homes along the way. Um, then, they, then they're on the streets and that's where they find family, that's where they find love. That's right. um, and so why don't you tell us a bit more about the, 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 the we versus them thing as well as the, um, some of these preconceived notions. Yeah, um, you know, I, uh, so I, I really like, uh, Jason had mentioned it in one of the panels he was talking about, about this idea, uh, Jason DeLeon had mentioned, uh, as about this, um, 
uh, this idea that when we talk about migrant studies, which is similar uh, in, in the work that I do, that there's this, this, this tendency to have to build up the migrant as a human being. And why don't we just start with the assumption that this is a human being? Mm -hmm. And I tend to go that route. Instead of saying, let's show that this person who's experiencing homelessness is a real person, why don't we start by understanding that we're all people mm -hmm. and that we all make similar choices based upon the options that we see before us. That there are many forces of displacement, of destabilization, of unsettlement, right? That, that they can be from our families, they can be historical economic forces, they can be based on our skin tone or gender. Um, we call these structural violence, right? Mm -hmm. All these different ways that have these implicit and explicit constraints on our ability to uh, produce healthy lives. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that the way that I like to think about it is that if, if we are all making choices that, we, s be, that are, are, we perceive as optimum within our environment of options, then that's very humanizing, right? Because why the person is sleeping on the corner is a result of a response to environmental options which they perceive before them, mm -hmm. right? And that is actually for me, not only is it at base humanizing because it is not they, it is we, I'm a part of that environmental option, right? That's where I, when I talk about the social suffering as a social experience, but it also I think is um, a way that is empowering in that uh, as, a, as a social scientist and someone who's attempting a, a sense of praxis of applying this into, in, into practice is that I can affect an environment Right? I can introduce new options or work with policymakers to affect the way options are provided to people. The choice is agentive, right? The person is going to make this choice as, the, as their own agent. But we can offer options that are more healthy and more beneficial, right? And so I see that like that seeing it in this way opens up new opportunities to do good work right, to do transformative work, and that by limiting ourselves to this understanding of they versus we, right, it allows us to sort of offset that responsibility, that guilt, that yeah. neoliberalism of saying, this person didn't play the game right, so it's their fault, mm -hmm. right, when the reality is we're all part of the game, mm -hmm. that um, one of the things I, I uh, often say is that, you know, there's this old saying of, of we're all one paycheck away, right, from mm -hmm. homelessness. Mm -hmm. I like to say, no, we're not, it's the paycheck you get right now. Right? It, is the, it is the fact that we are able to be successful and be able to be healthy and live in the homes that we have, but not everybody has access to that same level of, level of resources. Mm -hmm. Our paychecks are part of what makes our lives great, but they're not shared by that other person out there too. Mm -hmm. And so it is the success that we have that has a flip side of people who have, have not, who have become mm -hmm. have nots. Mm -hmm. And how do we help to equalize that within our society mm -hmm. so that we can bring those people to the table so that so that not only is that that productivity from that person the tax base from that person but truly that those that intellectual work can be brought back to the table and we can actually grow as a as a human as a human species yeah. Yeah. from engaging all of us yeah it's a really important way to look at it it's it's looking at it from a um the systems thinking perspective or a cybernetic perspective of that I am I am who I am and I have had the access to what I've had and that has also had an impact on what other people have access to and what they right. have and so okay so um, walk us through what happened from um, from from going out into the field of Jason DeLeon to mm -hmm. on to realizing that you want to do the vehicle residency project and yeah start telling and doing the work yeah so I uh, so after returning from the field of Jason like I said I was rip roaring and ready to go and I knew I wanted to do um, work that was compelling and meaningful <coughs> excuse me uh, and uh, and so I, I actually I, I, I purchased an RV and I started actually living on the streets of Seattle uh, rather naively and I would do it differently <laughs> if I was to do it again. Mm -hmm. um, mainly because uh, one of the things I quickly realized was that my experiences were not the same as people who were living on the streets. I had a home to return to. Um, and also that limited my understanding of the vehicle as a home. Mm -hmm. um, because since I had this other place I called home, the vehicle was much more of a 
temporary p space. Uh, whereas for you know people who are living in the vehicle, it was home, and that was a, really a significant difference. And it was one of the kind of first insights into this whole um, sort of assemblage of vehicle residency. Uh, another thing, really quickly though, that I did see that was helpful was that I saw that there was this tremendous amount of law enforcement that was being applied. That um, not only, of course, uh, you know the tickets and the warnings you got to move every seventy-two hours. But that there was signage everywhere I went that was saying you can't park here, and and it was signage that that particularly related to people living in vehicles. So um, I was finding that in these industrial zones where that there was laws in Seattle that I could only park my RV in industrial zones. Uh, this is a really common law mm -hmm. uh, that you can only park vehicles that are over say 80 inches wide at the wheelbase in industrial zones um, because you don't want those parking in, in residential streets for emergency vehicles coming down in the middle of the night, right? So you can only park those vehicles in industrial zones in the night time, right? So uh, between midnight and 5 a.m., I had to park my RV in industrial zones, just like every other person in an RV. And then in those zones, I saw the placement of no parking 2 to 5 a.m. signs, right? Which you go, well, why do you, where's the street sweeping? <laughs> you know, at 3 a.m. in the industrial zone. I mean, it's just, it's not there. Those signs were put specifically to remove vehicle residents from public space. Um, and that, uh, that actually is what, what started uh, the, uh, what drove my, the archeological aspect of my research, the, the ethnoarchaeological aspect, uh, in that I did uh, three years of settlement mapping and actually mapped where people were parking vehicles and RVs, trucks, vans, and, uh, and um, uh, cars uh, on the streets and correlating that with zoning, parking laws, resources, and showing how these settlement patterns were being driven by the constrained options that were available within their environment. Um, and how then that created densities within the settlement patterns over time, which then led to further community complaints, which led to more no parking 2 to 5 a.m. Mm -hmm. signs, which reduced the amount of space and created more density, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. so um, I, uh, I produced a report uh, so during this time, I, I worked for, with Seattle University leading the vehicle residency research program and uh, conducted two years of that mapping with that program, one year as my undergraduate at University of Washington for my un honors thesis um, in vehicle residency, and, uh, and then uh, presented that report to the city of Seattle, helped to, uh, to uh, lobby for the, pr uh, the creation of a safe parking program mm -hmm. that would provide off-street parking for people living in vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote the grant for that program, and uh, we ended up start developing it in Seattle back in um, uh, 2012, 2013, and I uh, applied to become the outreach provider for that program so that I could continue my research through it. And uh, from 2000, um, I think it was 2013, 2015, I was the, uh, the outreach specialist, as it was called, for all vehicle residents in Seattle. So mm -hmm. uh, during that time, for those two years, I worked with about 1,500 people who were living in vehicles uh, all across the city. Um, in Seattle, I should probably say the numbers of what, 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 what mm -hmm. we're looking at. Um, so in Seattle, there are roughly 12,000 people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, about half of those people are in some form of emergency, transitional, or permanent shelter. Uh, so about 6,000 are in that. About the other, the other 6,000 are, are on the streets, what are counted as unsheltered. Mm -hmm. Of that unsheltered population, 53% are living in vehicles. So of the people on the street, over half are mm -hmm. living in a car, truck, van, or RV. Uh, it's 3,300 people, roughly across King County, and, uh, and yet there are virtually no parking spaces for people in those mm -hmm. programs, uh, in any kind of emergency services. So that's why we developed the Safe Parking Program, um, and, uh, and then I did this research to help to kind of get a better understanding of, of uh, what the on-the-ground experiences were for people. Again, because I knew that I, there was only so much I could get as sort of auto-ethnographic research from my own occupation of the RV, um, and so I wanted to know more about what people were really experiencing in their own lives. So, um, so for two years I did that outreach work. Uh, afterwards, I worked for the Social Service Oversight Agency, that's H the HUD mandated uh, Continuum of Care Oversight Agency as they're called, uh, which is called All Home. And I worked with them for two years on their executive and governing board and as chair of their policy committee. Uh, looking at how social service policy and social services and policy was being developed around vehicle residency. Uh, and I saw that, uh, well, there was abysmally no <laughs> policies being developed. I, I shouldn't laugh. It's, 
it was horrible. Uh, there uh, were almost no um, recognition of the vehicle as a home. Um, and, uh, and because of that, uh, because of this sort of, um, what I have come to term a nomadic pathology, a, a view of nomadic shelters as inherently sick and wrong, as diseased, disease producing and amoral, that there's this criminality and, and, and filth or, or drug addiction, all these sorts of things that are built into this, that because we have, that settled societies have this tendency to view these nomadic shelters this way, that they could not be viewed as acceptable or appropriate. And so incorporating them into official state-run emergency systems was almost impossible. Mm -hmm. And so that's what a lot of my research has come to, to focus on is how the, this nomadic pathology uh, disaffiliates people uh, from their society and how it, it opens them to this uh, criminalization uh, that is justified because we see it as they shouldn't be living in that vehicle in the first place. Mm -hmm. right? and, and for many people, uh, there's this very important uh, tension between the vehicle as home and this label of homelessness, mm -hmm. right? And that the, the, the label of homeless is a negative identifier mm -hmm. label that mm -hmm. presents this impossible barrier to overcome of mm -hmm. how do you become homed mm -hmm. when you are homeless by definition, mm -hmm. right? And so for people who are living in their vehicles who see it as home, not only does that not match their identity, but when social services come in that are for, quote, the homeless, they say, that's not me, I don't need your help. Mm -hmm. So again, you've got this double problem mm -hmm. of not only do you have 53% of the population who don't actually have a parking space to connect them to services, mm -hmm. but they may not even want the services offered because the way that we're calling those services yep. doesn't match their identity, yep. right? And this is the kind of thing where <clears throat> simple changing in our understanding of this can have a massive effect, right? Because understanding that this is a, that this, vehicle is an adaptive sheltering strategy that this person is is using this vehicle as what they perceive as optimal shelter among a limited variety of options right that these vehicles have become affordable housing and that in that case there's this this major problem of what does that mean as more and more people move into these vehicles as affordable housing i think we'll, we'll get to that more in a bit but yeah that's that what i call the nomadic turn <laughs> wow. So what a crazy kickoff to talking about the Vehicle Residency Project because the way that the way that you're talking about the systems that are in place, it just reminds me of our conversations that we've had with people and I it's so hard to even use the word homeless again. Good. And we've got to figure it out. The, the yeah. right nomenclature. I, I maybe prefer to say people experiencing homelessness. People right. experiencing Be homelessness. I, I that's think that's about, better. I yeah. think about it as it's, a, it's an adjective, right? Homelessness is an adjective. It's not a label, right? We use it as, a, as an identity, as a noun, yeah, right? But do, the reality yeah. is, is that it, it's, it's like, I compare it to driving a car. When you're driving a car, you're a driver. When you're not driving a car, you're not a driver. That's a good way to put it. <laughs> yeah, that's right? a really good way to put it. <laughs> so so um, people experiencing homelessness, exactly, because um, th th again, these, these new ways of speaking about it are really important, especially in getting people the services that they need. Mm -hmm. So um, this reminds me of our conversations we've had with people who are experiencing homelessness because they're teaching us about all of the aspects to the system that are causing them the struggle of trying to get off of the streets. That's they right. are trying to get off, but there are so many variables that are pressing them. Mm -hmm. um, and you started listing these um, these variables, like um, if you have more than an 80 inch wheelbase, then you can't park 12 to five, but then where you have to go to park mm -hmm. off, uh, no parking from two to 5 a.m. Right. So um, now you also started kind of teaching us that 
you know, out of the 12,000 homeless in Seattle, uh, people without homes in Seattle, um, that there are 6,000 of them in sheltered um, residencies and whatnot. And then there's uh, um, 6,000 that are that are that are on the streets, and 3,300 of them are in um, vehicle residence. Mm -hmm. So over 53% of the ones on the streets are in vehicles, right. and there's no place for them to actually um, to to park their their vehicle that they live in. And so now you've made mm -hmm. this this push for there to be space that um, for them to actually be able to park and and have their vehicle as their residency in mm -hmm. these in, the, in spaces to, to facilitate the proper um, because there is no them this is all us and right. so we have to figure right. that out and now as you're as you know as you were speaking about that I was thinking about New York and LA and San Francisco and Chicago and all these other places that have equivalent numbers if not more um, than 12,000 people living right. on the streets and that's um, a lot of of, 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 of societal systemic change that I yep. think you are pioneering so um, okay so now now as you're as you're doing this research you 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 went you had you had a thousand five hundred people that you were talking to on a daily basis mm -hmm. about what was going on in their lives of course uh, there was a Up pool of, of 1500 people that i would be working with over those two years but yeah pool of 1500 people right. that you were working with over those two years talking to learning about their diverse stories and life trajectories right. and so now what were you learning about their experiences that was like holy crap Rap, we yeah. have to change some of the things in our system. You know, I would say that 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 the the main takeaways that I got that I think were really sort of revelatory were uh, first off, and they shouldn't be. I should say they should not be revelatory, but they were for me, and I and I hope that they can be for others as well. That. Uh, First off, that these were people who were displaced from their own communities. That uh, these weren't people who had come to the city as a way to get their resources. That by and large, the vast majority of the people that I was meeting, not just people living in vehicles, also people in tents, but definitely among the people that were in vehicles, were people that were from Seattle or the surrounding area that were using their vehicles as a way to maintain their connections to their familiar medical, social, and uh, social service systems. Right, and that they used these vehicles again as this affordable housing to maintain this connection to the city, right? And that what had happened was that the over the previous decades there had been a labor market and technology shift in this in Seattle, which we experience in San Francisco and LA and other of the main cities, which are experiencing the same problem or same issue, I should mm -hmm. the challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, that that there has been this labor market shift and people who have the background or the, the privilege of education or wealth to be able to move into that new labor market of high tech and information economy have been able to do very well and been able to uh, succeed in that. And this is where the it's our paycheck now, mm -hmm. right? But those who are from the uh, a blue collar background or for the many different reasons of structural violence, skin tone, gender, mm -hmm. uh, gender identity even, um, or and many more, uh, uh, are, are barred from getting into that new economy and uh, or from the educational background to get into that economy or, or employment background. And so because of that, this shift has displaced this population that people have the um, gentrification the, the gentrification yeah that's one way to look at it and and it's and but it's not just gentrification it's mm -hmm. I, I always look at it uh, that because when we think about it as gentrification we respond with well we need more affordable housing but I'd say okay but affordable housing today is unaffordable housing tomorrow if you don't have a job yeah you call right? them vi what you call them, violent structural uh, impediments or the, I'm not sure. <laughs> the the, the so anthropologists um, call it structural violence. Well, structural violence. Structural yeah. violence. Structural violence. Yeah. And so that structural violence is what um, holds people back based on yeah skin tones or right. yeah. it's the yeah. isms the, right yeah. you know the racism yeah. sexism yeah. gen you know whatever yeah, yeah. you know yeah. um, ableism and that that that. The, and it's it's really it's the explicit and implicit biases that 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 are held that create um, constraints on a per person's ability to have agency that is positive, right? And often it, it constrains people to choices that have negative outcomes. 
right? And so, um, and it, it, it's, it's a, it becomes a social indicator of health, right? That ultimately it, the person, ha it, there are negative health outcomes that often come from not being able to get into a great job because of restrictions based upon your skin tone, for example. Right? So displacement was a reoccurring yeah. theme that's right, yeah. So, so I had seen uh, displacement uh, occur occurring in Seattle and uh, people were, uh, were being, uh, they were unable to, as they were, there was this large rental base, as the, uh, the rents were going up because of the new economy, people were becoming evicted. Uh, they were then moving into their vehicles or moving onto public streets often moving in the street and then moving into a vehicle because it was an optimum shelter. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then because there was no place off the street or in particular out of the vehicle for a place to park the vehicle and connect to emergency systems that help settle mm -hmm. people and stabilize them, um, because there was no process to do that, this, this, this population just keeps growing and growing. Uh, and this is why actually, so even though we're, we're at 53% this year, or vehicle residents are 53% of the unsheltered population this year, they have been actually at least 30% for the last 10 years. And in the last 10 years, that population, because it's, it's been rising, I should say they're 30% of the unsheltered population for the last 10 years. Over that time, the total vehicle residency population has risen by 383%. Mm. So we're talking about uh, 2008, it was something like um, around uh, like 800 people, mm -hmm. and now it's 3,300. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's been happening across major metropolitan cities. That's, exactly right. that's cities. right, and that's was, and that's why I think that, that that's the takeaway here is that what we're seeing is a, a, is a response to internal displacement, mm -hmm. and that uh, again that people are turning towards these vehicles as affordable housing, and which leads me to this larger consideration, sort of a hypothesis mm -hmm. at the end of my my dissertation mm -hmm. of what does that tell us about the nomadic turn about mm -hmm. this sort of this these individual social uh, the individual cho uh, choices becoming normalized into social trends yeah. right and and we even see this you know obviously we see a lot in san francisco i you know mm -hmm. there's a lot of uh, rvs uh in san francisco i should mention that as part of my research i've done a uh, i do a critical discourse analysis where i look at uh 500 articles about vehicle residency all across the country mm -hmm. for the last five years uh looking at how this how we view vehicle residency in our media and uh and in particular particular about how much it's being referred to as affordable housing and how that trend is becoming more normal. Yeah. Um, in places like LA, and I'm not sure if you're aware, but they recently had to pass laws where uh, to restrict people from buying RVs, putting them on the street and renting them as apartments uh, because there were so many people doing it. And that is exactly what I'm talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Is that, that what does it mean to our society to move towards mobile housing as the new version of shelter, yeah. right? And uh, there are reasons why that's very pragmatic, right? Especially when we look at you things like- You can move your house. You can move your house. And you look at things like the, you know, these fires in, in California right now, there's a lot of people right now that have been displaced from these fires that are living in their vehicles and it makes perfect sense for them. Yeah. But I think you we need- You don't have to pay 1,500, 2,000 uh, right. a month in rent. That's right. But I think that we need to take a step back and go back to why, you know, looking at, you know, there is no they, we are we, yeah. right? that, that the re if we're all people and we're making choices based upon the, environment all op the environmental mm -hmm. options that we mm -hmm. perceive before us, mm -hmm. then we need to look at that person living in that vehicle not as a good thing, right? We gotta look at it as this is the response to an environmental set of options, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that has possible benefits, possible detriment, right? It is not always just progressive, right? There's not all this, you know, march towards, you mm -hmm. know, a future of greatness, right? These things can be good and bad. And that, um, and that, that, that we need to see that vehicle as a response to yeah. these larger social environmental pressures that, um, that may have um, a larger destabilizing effect on our society. Because yeah. um, we're honestly not prepared for 3,000 RVs moving from city to city. Yeah, and you, you're so at the forefront of talking about this in terms of it being a trend towards mobile housing. Right. And you're also at the forefront of talking about it in terms of the 
um, it's all about us and not about a them type scenario because when you think about it as a them type scenario you're we're taking the blame and we're moving it away from a society and we're putting it onto the individuals that are involved there right. um, but this is a this is a, a direct effect of the economic and the political pressures that we've that we've created and um, that's why we see so much displacement and towards this mobile housing now within the mobile housing um, there is a um, there's there is a percentage of people that um, that have a desire to be in mobile housing. There's a percentage mm -hmm. of people that are writers or artists or ph uh, f um, uh, um, philosophers or um, or entrepreneurs in some w ways that they want to musicians they want themselves to become. Uh, uh, with home um, mm -hmm. um, instead of people without home mm -hmm. and so um, mm -hmm. so then there's so there's these categories of people that are within um, the the people that are in living in via in res vehicle residencies so um, that breakdown is also really important to understand there are actually people that are a addicted to really addictive drugs mm -hmm. and uh, also and that 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 desperately need social services to also um, assist in that sense. So that breakdown is also extremely important to, to figure out and understand. And just hearing you talk about this, it, when I heard, first heard you talking about this, it's just so near and dear and close to um, our hearts in, um, in San Francisco and our studios right on uh, Market and 7th Street in downtown. And so we have a, you know, our, we see so much um, right there of, of, of not only people um, living without a home, but also um, we see a lot of, of vehicle residents and we also see a lot of, um, a lot of the diversity of people living without home, like, mm -hmm. like I was just describing that mm -hmm. breakdown. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what, do you, what are your thoughts about that mm -hmm. breakdown of people and just give us give us your thoughts yeah. about that breakdown. Well, I think, uh, you know, I think uh, that uh, I, I would push back on a little bit on that. Please, I, and, please. and I would I would um, say that it's not quite as hard and fast as that. And that mm -hmm. and that we should getting back to that whole there's no they we are all we mm -hmm. thing that that people um, that that there are many forces of displacement. Um, they can be personal. They can be social. They can be endemic. Uh, they can be things like you had a bad relationship with your dad. Right. So when I was homeless, I didn't get along with my family. Right. I, I came from a very privileged place, especially considering many other people that I know. And I was able to return to that, which is a tremendous sense of privilege. Um, at the same time, that what moved me into that place of being homeless was important for me, important for me enough to live on the streets. Right. And that was a force of displacement. Now, is it the same as um, other forms of structural violence? No, there's many different, different reasons why people get into this. Um, and I would add that uh, many, of the, um, many of the behaviors that we, that we observe among people who are experiencing homelessness, such as drug addiction or, or substance use as a whole, not only are they reflected throughout our society and we don't ask the same questions of the person who's in the condo above the person who's sleeping on the street, mm -hmm which is important, right, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. but those, just like that person in the condo, the people, people use substances as ways to manage and mitigate and medicate their traumas. Mm -hmm. And you find when you work with people experiencing yeah. homelessness that many people experiencing homelessness did not use those substances before they became homeless mm -hmm. and they began using those substances as ways to mitigate the traumas mm -hmm. they were experiencing. Yeah. So, you know, how do you go to sleep at 3 a.m. when it's freezing out? Well, drinking yourself into oblivion is a lot easier. Okay, how do you stay up all nights with your stuff because you're afraid of it? Well, taking a couple hits of something mm -hmm. to stay up all night is a good way to do it. Mm -hmm. and, and that sort of behavior is done as a response to the environment, which again, what happens when you change the environment, right? So this is why things like, you know, what I'm talking about isn't um, 
it's not that like it's not controversial. This is this is what the housing first model is based on. This is actually what HUD, you know, the, the Department of Housing and Urban Development is is focused on right now is trying to find ways to get people into safe spaces immediately so that then we can remove them from the environmental traumas that they experience on a daily and nightly basis and start to actually provide the stability that offers them long-term development with, with the immediate relief. And that's really what I found in yeah. this research ultimately is what do we need to do? We need to look at this as a two-pronged issue and we always focus on one or the other and it's not that, it has to be both relief and development. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> really. Yes. And so the relief <laughs> portion is the integration of the traumas in ways um, that are preventative of people without homes. So I would say the relief portion is providing a, a, a relief from the trauma now. Yeah, relief from trauma na immediately, so that way there is no trajectory that sends people to p being without home. Yeah, yeah because or, 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 or at least at least helps it at least removes them from the the the. The, the continuation of traumas that they're currently experiencing. Exactly. So at least we can, we can in a sense, you can never s completely cease it because a lot of trauma becomes internalized, but you can at least remove people from the environmental traumas that are experiencing around them. Yes, and because uh, as I'm learning about this more from you, I'm seeing it as similar to the pathologies that occur within the body. Right. We've had so many brilliant um, anti-aging scientists that we've sat down with, and whenever we talk to them, it's all about identifying the pathologies before they start. Right. And then that's, exactly that's right. how you can like tweak the body over time yep. to be yep. healthy. And so it's the same exact thing as you're starting to see that this kid is having significant trauma with his father and mm. there there is about to be a 15 year old on the streets right. how can we intervene and prevent that 15 year old right. from entering that situation That's and so it, right. and so and so you also make these points about substance addictions they don't happen when they're living in a home this happens when you're trying to protect your stuff or when you're trying to deal with the freezing cold temperatures yeah. these different situations um, so that's okay so, and then so then there's the um, there's the relief, um, and then there's the, um, the long-term development. Long -term development. De so then the development is okay. So then there's a situation that we have right now with vehicle residencies. So how do you develop a mm -hmm. <coughs> a current place for vehicle residencies to go to, but also develop a city like Amazon's HQ2 hmm. is moving into um, mm -hmm. Long Island City and it's moving right. into um, Crystal City um, in Virginia. Mm -hmm. And so when you're when you're looking at these two uh, these two uh, cities that uh, in Nashville as well, where Amazon's moving into mm -hmm. that, that there needs to be some sort of a of a promise, a community promise mm -hmm. of hey, we know that we're bringing so much economic opportunity and development to these areas. And um, that's extremely important for your cities, but also we know that we're going to be causing displacement. Mm -hmm. And because we know we're going to cause displacement, we're going to do a bunch of preventative measures like we were talking about earlier that are going to prevent that displacement from occurring. So that might be the development that you're talking about where you develop affordable housing um, or whatever. What, what would be Well, so, so I think of the, when I talk about relief, relief and development, I'm talking about, I think of it in a little bit different way because mm -hmm. I'm talking about it with people who are currently experiencing displacement. Mm -hmm. um, the, the issue of, of, of Amazon is, is near and dear to my heart as someone from Seattle doing research in Seattle uh, who, who moved to Seattle in 96 and when Amazon, before they really became mm -hmm. big, um, and I worked in the dot-com boom and bust alongside when Amazon was growing up as well. So, um, you know, uh, I, I know a lot of people work at Amazon. I've worked with Amazon many times in the corporate and my, my nonprofit does as well. Um, and so uh, a lot of that is what informs that idea of it's our paycheck now, right? That, that, that economic success, we shouldn't demonize that economic success because there's obviously a lot of value that can come along with it. Now, I think everybody should pay their fair, fair share of taxes um, <laughs> and be able to support our economy as a whole, but that's kind of a different discussion. Um, but when it, when it comes to uh, uh, what those forces, um, uh, what forces a company like Amazon can bring to bear in terms of displacement on new cities. Uh, I saw it in Seattle. I saw it for the last 
20 years. Um, and I do know, I have a pretty good idea of what these other cities are going to be seeing, and it is going to be massive displacement, most likely. I shouldn't say that. There's a, uh, the, the, uh, the, the history that we saw in Seattle tends to uh, show that there's a good chance that you're going to see similar things, right? And that you're going to see uh, forces of displacement uh, because of, again, this increased um, uh, income base, which then rises, drives up housing costs, because of course, if you have the opportunity to charge more, you're going to charge more if you're a landlord. And then the people who do not have access to those jobs at Amazon or the industries that surround Amazon, which you'll see pop up as well, like we did in Seattle, um, are going to be priced out of their market. And that uh, I think that much like what we need to do in Seattle, we need to do that, that, that Amazon, if you want to look at how they're going to um, protect against that displacement, how they can help to ensure that they won't be bringing in uh, structural violence into these communities, uh, is that they need to incorporate those communities into that success. And it's more than just bringing in these jobs, because they bring in the jobs and they bring in the people to fill those jobs. They need to target the communities themselves to fill those jobs. And that's why a lot of the work that I do now with, uh, I, I, I uh, am a member of the, I was appointed a couple months ago to the uh, mayor of Seattle's Innovation Advisory Council. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the work that I'm doing there is pushing towards a, um, an integration of rapid rehousing of like the programs that provide um, uh, subsidized housing for up to a year, uh, along with year up training programs at these top 10% of our employers. So that what we can actually do is, is ways to integrate people who have been displaced into the businesses that are causing the displacement, right? Because that's actually, that's how we solve this problem of mm -hmm. affordable housing is unaffordable if you don't have a job, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We need to get people the jobs, but you also need the immediate relief. So that's relief and development, mm -hmm. right? Get a house right now and provide people the skill set yes. to be able to afford that house a year from now. And that right there is not new. That's the new deal. I was just about to ask <laughs> you to go into that. <laughs> you know, yeah. So there, there <laughs> were, Th there were three million people. <coughs> two million. I did them. I checked you it out. You checked it I out. I did check it, it out. Two. two million. Million. I was okay. one million off. <laughs> so, so there was a period of time where there. Right now, we're looking at about three hundred fifty or four hundred thousand homeless people in the United States. People experiencing homelessness. Sorry, people <laughs> experiencing homelessness. We're trying to change the nomenclature. <laughs> yes. So, for people experiencing homelessness eighty years ago, right. this was around nineteen thirty-five, mm -hmm. and the New Deal mm -hmm. was, tell us about how that took two million people right. and helped those people without homes. Right, stabilize. Yeah. yeah. Um, and settle into their communities is, yes. is really the point. Settle into the communities. That, um, so so e I'll even take a step back. Uh, if you look at where that population came from, it, it was originally, it, it was from forces of displacement that go all the way back to the founding of the United States. I mean, it was some of, the, some of these people were um, indigenous populations originally. Some of them were uh, uh, poor whites, poor uh, non-whites, poor uh, people of all different backgrounds who have been displaced, who have fa faced these similar issues of evictions and rental costs, um, and uh, and became this this basic massive poor underclass of our society, um, and uh, particularly the Civil War was was very disastrous upon this this group. Um, the the destruction of the lands of the farms of people's uh, you know people would go off to war and there'd be nowhere to return to north and south. And so um, at the end of the Civil War, give this little brief history, uh, uh, those soldiers were brought back to New York uh, so that they could be cleared out uh, through the train lines, the new train lines. And so they brought everybody back to say, okay, you're no longer north and south. We're back together. We're going to clear you out from being a soldier and send you home. And so they'd put them on, on railroads out of Hoboken. And those became the hobos. And that's actually where that term comes from, mm. originally, is from these hobo armies that were initially <coughs> mobilized as, a, res as uh, a clearance of soldiers from the Civil War. And those soldiers had no homes to return to. They started on the road. And they started looking for jobs where they could. And again, at the same time, you had a technological shift of this turn towards industrialized farming. Right, And so as we have this move towards industrialized farming, a lot of the farms that were subsistence farms that had been before were getting brought up into larger plantations with, you know, in the south they were, you know, using sharecropping and in the north and in the west we had these large, you know, fields and everything. Those, all of that was then 
was um, the, the hobos became this workforce that were moving across the country uh, as the labor market shifted into industrialized mining and industrialized timber, that force moved with it to become the workforce that moved into the West, right? And into s places like Seattle, where they worked to become part of the, uh, the lumber industry. Um, and, uh, and James Spradley, who uh, did a lot of this work, wrote his book, uh, You Owe Yourself a Drunk, a dr Owe Yourself a Drunk About Tramps, um, talks a lot about that, about how this sort of this rise of this, um, this population. Uh, and then what happened was, is that by the, the 1930s, as you mentioned, uh, 1920s, uh, there were around two million people who were experiencing homelessness in, this in the country, the United States. And they were, uh, you know, colloquially called the tramp and hobo armies moving from city to city. And, uh, and what's interesting is that the, the initial response to that to help to stabilize that group, many of us forget, but it was actually called the transient service. And I think it's important that we, that, that we you know, take a moment to, to think about what that term means because at that stage, the social service providers saw that what was needed was stability, mm -hmm. was settlement, mm -hmm. that there was this movement, this, this mobility, this migration of people that was the issue, right? And that if people could be settled in the place where they were, mm -hmm. then they could be provided that development. Mm -hmm. That's the relief and the development. And so at that time, there was this growth of these places called Hoovervilles, which we've, we've all probably heard of. And we often see these pictures of these places as these massive sources of urban blight. The one in Seattle is one of the most famous. There's this real famous picture of the, of the Seattle Hooverville. And, but what we don't know, um, uh, or we've forgotten, is that those were places of settlement, that those were places where people were finally allowed to settle down, and the government came in with social services and brought in educational programs, uh, childcare programs, job retraining programs, and that those were what became eventually the New Deal, with its rights and wrongs. I'd obviously freely admit that. They're not, New Deal is by no means perfect, and, and in it enforced its own systems of structural violence and with redlining and, and uh, other very problematic things. Um, but one of the things that it definitely did right was that it, uh, it said uh, that what we needed to do was to not only provide these people with a space where they can be now, but we need to provide them with the skills to build out the economy, to build out their new cities. So we employed... Ooh, settlement and skills. Settlement and skills, relief and development. Yeah. And so what we did was is that we employed that population to build things like the Hoover Dam, mm -hmm. so that suddenly now these people are laying concrete and they're pipe fitting and they're putting in electrical lines. Well, those skills is what they then used once everything was done to ship that person off to Ohio to build out their own little town. And right, right now and we could potentially use coders or designers or exactly operations right. That's right, and at a time when we have record unemployment, specifically for that market, because much of the people who are, on, who are unemployed but have fallen off that roster, as we know, which skews our unemployment numbers, those are people who don't necessarily have access to get into that high-tech jobs. Yes. In the high-tech jobs, we have record unemployment. Yeah. We need more people in those jobs. Yeah. Those, com com those industries are hiring like bad, yeah. and they're looking for people that they can help to sort of uh, mold yeah. into the positions that, they, that they're looking for. Absolutely. And we have this population who desperately want to settle down, who want a safe place to be, who want to fit in with their, so their our society. Right, and, and really see this as home, that this is still their home, and yet they're being moved out from their home, own homes because these new industries have come in. So going back to the Amazon <laughs> discussion, right, that this is what Amazon, I, in my opinion, needs to do to help to address that in places in New York and in DC, is in Crystal City, is that uh, we need to first off uh, uh, incorporate uh, the uh, people who do not historically have uh, the access to those jobs into the hiring practices to get them into those jobs. That's first off how we address this on a structural level, right? And then for the people who will become displaced, we need to actually funnel that population directly into those jobs as well. So I think that it needs to be sort of twofold, that, that there needs to be an initial approach of how do we hire local populations mm -hmm. to work at these incoming industries yeah. so we don't displace them. Yeah. And then if there is displacement, which often there is and we see, then we need to specifically focus our social services to hiring people into those programs. And we have these services already. I mean, it's workforce. I mean, it's, it's labor force. I mean, these systems um, and the private and public market, the federal government's been running job retraining systems for decades, mm -hmm. right? And, and we, you know, it, it's, it's not a radical idea. 
You know, it's a it's it's a matter of of believing that there is not a, a deserving and undeserving population, that we are all we, mm -hmm. and that by supporting that group, that we are helping our total society, and that not that, that that person just needs to be pushed away and we need to focus on the good ones, right? And that's really yeah. what we seem to have been doing, and it's causing a lot of, a lot of um, destabilization. Yeah, yeah. The... The vision of seeing a tech giant using its abilities, resources to bring people that are without a home in for uh, with social workers and with coders to re to retrain, um, I think can happen within um, within a year. I, I, I do think that it, it, it very much so um, could happen. Um, and I was just, I was just, it was just envisioning what that would look like, and it was really c cool to to think about. But it's very, very difficult to um, repattern someone's habits and their cognition to desire to mm -hmm. code or design or do ops. It, it's just, it's not impossible. It's mm -hmm. just difficult. And so, but it, but well, it, well yeah. I, I, would, I would agree, and I think that 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 um, and actually, in this is, I want to touch back on your your initial question about sort of the uh, varieties of nomadism. Maybe we could say right yeah, the, yeah. the sort of that <clears throat> idea of wanderlust of the yeah, person who's yeah. inherently driven towards moving. Uh, and and mm -hmm. displaced people who are who are uh, migratory by the imperatives of their environment, as, as Deleuze would say. Um, the uh, I think that that um, first off that 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 by uh, by providing these skill sets, uh, you know, the person may not take that job at Amazon, but now they have that skill set to be able to take it elsewhere, right? So that's the same. That's really mm -hmm. what the Hoover Dam was doing. It was no, that was not about mm -hmm. getting them to this job, yeah. but it was getting them to this skill industry, set, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So first off, there's a lot of potential, even if the person doesn't get hired in that one thing. Um, but there's also this. Um, uh, the uh, uh, in st studies of nomadism, this is why a lot of my research actually looks at this as a version of nomadism and this idea of, of what it means to sedentarize, that when people um, are, are pushed into movement by these destabilizing um, dis forces of displacement that have been going on for thousands of years, um, that when people are mobilized uh, and, and are, and are and, main t and, and live within these persistent, consistent, uh, destabilizing environments that say, you're not allowed here, you gotta keep moving. It's environmental pressures or social pressures or economic pressures, but that, that thing that says keep moving along, that, that people n nomadize. Right, they normalize to this migratory behavior because that's all they've come to know, right? It becomes normative, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And, and um, uh, that versus the settlement and skills. Well, and, and I would say that, that these people were raised in a settled society. Mm -hmm. yeah. These people are that's raised right. with the sedentary ideals that I have, and I, I'm sure you do yeah. as well, yeah. that, that, the, that the success that we can achieve in our lives is based upon settled life, mm -hmm. right? That, that having a job, having kids, putting clothes, you know, clothes on your kids, food on your table, having a good education, all those things are done by ha being settled down, right? And then we, and we teach ourselves that's what Robbie Mouvet calls the sedentarist hegemony, right? And then what he says is that the, the flip side of that is this anti-nomadism that says that anything that's nomadic is bad, right? And, and so when a person becomes nomadized uh, and becomes used to being sort of this, um, uh, being treated as a social other, as being pushed off on society, never really able to settle down. Uh, of course, one would normalize that as that's just how life is, mm -hmm. because that's all you see everywhere. Now, the flip side of that is, is that it takes time to normalize. It also takes time to sedentarize. That being able to wrap your head around what it means to live a settled life yeah. It takes effort and it takes yeah. work on the person involved, but also on people who are working with them, right? And so I always like to think of it like this. Sedentarization comes from giving someone a couch and a TV. When you put someone on a couch and put a big screen TV and they get to sit there and watch that, and after a while go, man, I really like watching this TV. What do I got to do to have that TV? Well, I got to have a job, got to have a house. That's sedentarization. It's when the person internalizes these ideas that they want to have that settled life. 
right? Well, if you only see the options available around you that say you must have a nomadic life, that's all you ever know. That's what you see is right, right? So this is what I'm saying. So is it's that about augmenting the lens of both uh, s the settled society to see that there is a nomadic society that does not know that there is a settled society and also to augment the lens of the nomadic society to say that there is a settled society where you can find more of a of a comfort and stability and a um, potentially a meaning from doing something fulfilling every day that is that is driven towards value I, I, I think it's I think that it's more of um, I, I like I like the way you put that but I think that it's more of a um, it's about, uh, I think that it's the work is more on what we need to do with the settled society. It's more about c telling the settled society that you know this person doesn't want to be a nomad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what right? I said. That was the first part that I said. <laughs> you know? Yeah, 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 that, yeah. that's, right. that's and, right. And then and on the other side, the thing is, is that once that work allows to space for that person who has been treated as a nomad to settle down, right? And that becomes that relief and development. All these other issues of wanderlust, right? Why doesn't the person want to settle? Why don't they feel engaged in their society, right? I mean, why did Thoreau go to Walden, right? right? Because he didn't feel he needed to go somewhere else, right? He didn't feel that this was right and that place may be that. Is that, a, is that a migrant? Is that a homeless person? Is that, no, it's a person who's moving in their life to find new things. We all do that. Right? So if you look at why do we do that, we can start to understand this better. If we look at the, you know, the, the trust fund kid who's traveling across the country with the surfboards in his RV or his van, hey, that's awesome, man. And, and it, but it, it's, I don't think there is a difference in that. That's vehicle residency, mm. that's displacement. It's a different force of displacement. Just like my force uh, that drove me mm. into homelessness mm. was a different force than many other people experience. Right, but 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 by by kind of splitting hairs over that, mm -hmm. we we get lost in the weeds and we lose the fact that it's about how do we find ways to um, to settle people. Yeah, the, right? the, <laughs> you the know, to be settled ourselves. This entire section yeah. of our conversation has so much for me to do with what is today's New Deal, like a yeah. really powerful yeah. new. Uh, version two of what a new deal was because the 350 to 400,000 people that are currently without home, um, a vast majority of them would want a settled. That's exactly right. And so we. And, we and they want to settle yeah. in our cities too. I think yeah. that's an important piece is that we often think about this as, oh, but we have all this vast farmland in the Midwest. If we just move people out that, you go, well, these are people who lived in the city. Before, why are we moving them the from the city? Why does somebody else get the right to the city, yeah. and the and the people who who don't have this new economy, access to the new economy, suddenly lose access to the city? That's not right. That's right. And you know? I want to touch on this because this is something that you've been um, working on now. You co-founded it, and you're executive mm -hmm. director of WeCount. Mm -hmm. um, so teach us about WeCount. Mm -hmm. So we count uh, directly came from this research and my experiences with homelessness. Um, touching back on that story of the person who gave me the quarter, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, I was trying to think about uh, how do how do we empower the public to be the provider of that quarter to all the little me's, the 15 year old me's around the world, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, or, or everybody else, not me, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but, but that, but that and, and I saw myself in that. And, 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 um, and how do we use that as a way to connect people to, to become that catalyst, to connect people to services that can help to settle them? And, uh, and so we developed WeCount. Uh, it's, a, it's a website, first off, it's not an app specifically so that people can use it in libraries mm -hmm. and social service mm -hmm. sites so that we could have low barrier access, mm -hmm. low barrier entry into that system. Um, we, uh, the, si the system was actually originally based upon uh, the ideas of Marcel Mauss uh, from The Gift. So again, it's very deeply centered in anthropology um, in that uh, one of the kind of, well, there's lots of stuff that, that Mauss talks about, but one of the main sort of uh, takeaways is that there's three aspects of giving that are sort of universal. Uh, you have a, a giver, a receiver, and then this act of reciprocation. And that if you don't have that reciprocation, you really don't see a repetition of the act of giving, right? Because there needs to be this thank you or 
maybe it's a grace from God, or maybe it's actual repayment. Maybe I get a gift back. I mean, there's all these different ways that we do reciprocation. But if you Biology's don't re get reciprocal that, reciprocal altruism. You, yeah. Right, you're, you, exactly. You're not going to want to be involved in the, in the future. And so looking at that, it was, okay, so we, we know what a giver would be. That would be the donor, the donating public. We know what the receiver would be. That would be the person requesting this item. But how do we do that as that reciprocation? And so we really, we started the whole project off actually the first six months before we built anything or designed anything. We interviewed people experiencing homelessness. We interviewed uh, social service providers, executive directors of nonprofits, public policy makers, uh, you know, human service division people all throughout Seattle um, to understand what was needed. And what we heard over and over again was people saying, look, don't reinvent the wheel. Don't create a new service. We got a lot of social services and we don't have the funding for them all as it is, right? What we need is, is uh, a, a way to um, bring people back to the well, right? To keep, keep people connected. This idea of, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Well, you lead the horse to water enough times, there's a good chance it's gonna drink. Mm. Right, mm -hmm. and and that's and I, I don't mean to talk about people as other animals in any sense, but you know that mm -hmm. that the the analogy or the metaphor holds totally. in that in that you know we provide <coughs> the carrot <laughs> to mm -hmm. help bring the person to the water mm -hmm. to help them to drink, and I'll I'll send you a video afterwards that you can you can use if if you're interested in your show, yeah. yeah. Um, but basically, what the system does is a person um, can request an item. Uh, they actually it, they request it from the Amazon marketplace, so we again activate their sense of agency, and uh, that they can request really anything they want. Uh, the restrictions are you know no weapons, no uh, combustible materials um, or uh, liquids. Um, uh, no food because we, you can't ship that through safely, and, and there's there's issues around that. Uh, but beyond that, it's it's like socks and, that, and underwear. And then they can, well, yeah. well, socks, underwear, tents, backpacks. It's all items that are under fifty dollars. But it also could be a hot plate. It could be a cell phone. It could be a tablet PC, mm -hmm. right? And there are them. There are tablets under fifty dollars. Yeah. Um, and so in or boots, right? Yeah. And so you know we we opened it to to really allow the person to search. You can do it as a search bar. You search through the Amazon marketplace, whatever you want, and you'll see this endless listing of these things and it's the same information you'd see on Amazon, but you don't see the price, right? And so the person go through and they can choose what size boots, what color boots, they then request that item. When they request the item the first time, uh, we present them with what's called a needs assessment uh, questionnaire. So it uh, asks questions like, um, are you looking for housing? Are you a veteran? Are you traveling with kids? It's all confidential and it's uh, securely held. Um, um, but so we ask these, these basic questions about what their needs might be. And then we suggest social service locations to pick up their item, yes. their donation, that actually match their needs. Yes. So then when you go on the site and there's a one si kind of site of this, one version of the site or one side of the site is for asking for items. The other side is for donating items. And so when you go into the donate side, you see the request from the person. Um, we use avatars instead of pictures to avoid implicit bias uh, because some people don't want to go, you know, give to people who don't look like them. Mm -hmm. It's all a, mm -hmm. a, a common form of implicit bias. Uh, and so we, so we do that. Person can, can tell a little bit about their story, a little bit about, you know, provide a little bio about themselves and then, uh, and why they're asking for this item. Uh, if they want to, they don't have to. Uh, and then we have the item listed. And so then the donor can go in and purchase the item directly through Amazon, uh, through a secured payment processor. Uh, and the item is then shipped directly to the location to connect the person with social services and needs. Brilliant. And then we provide the reciprocation at the end where we send the donor information about, Thank you for donating your backpack to Jimmy. You connected Jimmy with housing and veteran services. Boom. Yeah. yeah. I love the aspect of, of anonymity, but also um, of, it's like, it's, an, it's, an, it's not fully anonymous, but it's mm. just, exactly, it's just, it's just enough anonymous to not have bias. And then it's also um, getting them what they need, getting them to a social service location and, um, up offering them the resources that they need to help them get off the find a home if if they so um, desire right, to, and right. you're polling them to figure out the right social service location right. to send them to. It's really powerful. Um, mm -hmm. to check it out. The links in the bio for WeCount.org. Mm -hmm. Give it a look. And we're actually we're in the middle of upgrading the site right now. So if you go there, I don't know when this will mm -hmm. air, but you may see an under construction. But we're we're actually uh, talking with some um, major. I shouldn't mention the names, but uh, major social media players, which you are very much familiar with, mm -hmm. um, about uh, ways to integrate this into their platform. 
Great. And actually, so imagine you were on some of these social media platforms, and in and your you feed, saw you actually saw a request one for of a your backpack local and neighbors could, yeah. and needs a $20 backpack. That's right, and you could yeah. donate it right there through that. Yeah, yeah. that's fantastic. And that's yeah. going to be huge for helping people, and then they have to go to a social services center nearby to pick up the that's backpack. Right. And, 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 it, and it goes this, and it, it, I, we've talked I've, uh, a couple times, we use this word, this term push, right, of pushing people into stuff. Pull. And I really like to think the other way of pull. Yeah. That really what we're doing is, is that, and this comes again from my research with vehicle residents, so often I see people being pushed, pushed. around communities totally. and that doesn't solve anything. It removes people's agency, it removes people's resources. Push is like the displacement and That's pull the is displacement. like the pull is the Pull is the yeah. settlement. Yeah. That's right. That's exactly right. And so what we're trying to do is create poles into our systems to help keep people connected. That's right. And there's another, there's, an, th there's, there's this word that we're all familiar with. Um, the word is genius. Oh, and we were talking yeah. about this yeah. a couple nights ago, and I really enjoyed um, your definition of genius: one who inspires another to great thought. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily about an individual that is a genius, mm -hmm. but it's more so about that individual that knows how to inspire others to That's this right. great source of potential for themselves. That's and, right. And That's for right. the collective. So yeah, tell us a bit about that because it's so cool. Yeah, um, so it's, it's, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's not my definition. This is the original mm -hmm. Greek definition, actually. And so it's, yeah. it, uh, it's um, the, uh, the original, we, we've, the, the common uh, kind of understanding of genius, as you said, is, gen is generally some a single person who's very mm, abnormally gifted in intelligence, maybe might be a, a working definition, I don't know. Um, something along those lines, but it's generally an individual who's very smart in some way. Uh, but but the Greek definition was much more like a muse, um, in that a muse is uh, a, a thing or a person or an entity of some sort that inspires an, an artist towards producing great art. Mm -hmm. That is the same thing for a genius. And actually, if you look at the origin of the word genus, genus means origins, right? Mm -hmm. And so it becomes this origin, right? And so it is. It is genius is the that which inspires people to producing these great thoughts. And I, I, love, I love that idea because it's, it's much more, I think of it as a, as a democracy of intellect, right? The idea that, that we all have within us the, the potential towards great thought, that it is genius is are people like Jason DeLeon. Uh, I, I consider him a genius mm -hmm. that, you know, that uh, in my experiences working with Jason, he absolutely inspired me to think more deeply about my world and, uh, and to be much more critical. And, and, you know, I, there is absolutely no way that I would be doing my research had I not learned uh, that sense of critical thinking and the skills that I learned from him and other anthropologists uh, who I consider geniuses, uh, Rachel Chapman, Miriam Kahn, uh, 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 my Sven Hawkinson, my dissertation chair, Danny Hoffman, I mean, all these uh, amazing people I've been able to, to, to work with, Holly Barker, um, uh, who, who show that um, anthropology can be more than just theory, it can be praxis, which is the other thing we were talking about. Yes, that, yes, that this can, leads us into praxis, please. Yeah, yeah, that we can bridge this gap between sort of this navel gazing, staring down our noses anthropologists out of the world, uh, and, and, and get to a place where our work actually is affecting the world around us. Because y it's, um, anthropologists generally care. Right? That's why we get into this work, uh, hopefully, you know, that we, we do it because we're, we're passionate about humanity and about the world around us and why we do the things we do. And um, the history of, of the discipline has really been much more of this sort of extractive model of going in and, and finding these places to pull the data out, which then we make into our careers. And, and um, that doesn't sit very well with me. And, uh, and, and a lot of others too. I think there are a lot of us who uh, come from places of uh, various forms of inequality and various forms of privilege and look upon them reflexively <laughs> right? and say, you know what, I've been there on both sides and what can, th and, and then take that as a, as a sense of responsibility. Like for me, I, I feel a responsibility towards social structural change. Um, I, I, I feel like for that 15 year old me, and the 1,500 people that I worked with in vehicles, and my friends who are living in vehicles now, 
that if, if I am not doing work that is applying my theory to actually create large scale structural change that I'm not doing enough work. Right, I, that, that's hard. That's it's 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 it's, it's probably a maybe too much pressure that I put on myself in that regard. But, but it, it's it, powerful. It drives me. You yeah. know, and I and I'm not alone in that. You know, yeah. I mean, I think that's that's where um, that's where a lot of entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley are, yeah. are pushed towards actually executing an idea rather than just talking about. That's it. right. And I, and I think and to be honest, I think that that's the future of our of our discipline of of anthropology of, of yeah. the four field of the four fields of anthropology and. and as uh, ethnoarchaeologist, I think in particular archaeology has this amazing potential yeah. um, to uh, to do this work through analogy uh, yeah. and, uh, and and in ways that that sort of twist our minds around and make us think in whole new ways about what we see in front of us, what we've seen all our lives. Uh, one of my, my favorite uh, this is definitely gets into praxis, but one of my, my favorite quotes around this is from uh, William Rathshe, who was uh, one of the founders of sort of or one of the people who helped popularize ethnoarchaeology through his garbology work. And I encourage you to, to look more into that; it's very interesting. Garbology. Uh, garbology. Actually, he he. So so Rath, Rathshe went out and uh, looked at these uh, federal statistics and surveys that had been do being done for a hundred years about by the FDA about. Um, uh, and USDA about uh, food consumption patterns mm -hmm. and, and, and trash disposal patterns, mm -hmm. right? And then he would go in and excavate in that local dump down to that year and find out what people were actually disposing of. Mm -hmm. And in that way, what he, what he says is, is that our lives consists of these two versions of reality, of a mental reality of what we think is happening and we're just so sure that's real and then the material reality, which is the actual stuff that we're depositing in the earth. Yes. Right, and that we can compare those and bring those realities together to create this more holistic version yes. that is actual reality. That's right? truth. Yeah. And, and, and that's what I try to do with my work of looking at this mental reality of what does vehicle residency look like? How do we as a society look at it? And what are the physical realities of actually living in these conditions? And how does that shape by our social services and all this kind of stuff? And and that, in my mind, that's that being able to tie um, a, a, a current reality of persons living in a vehicle to past realities of mobile sheltering, things like the Irish travelers, the tinkers, uh, Roma, quote, gypsies, as they're sometimes referred, and I would mention to your audience that it is, that is a, a racial epithet, which many people push back at. I encourage people not to use the word gypsy. Um, and, and, and even on that note, it's often used for cultures all across the world, really, and it's really just about mobility. Mm -hmm. It again gets back to that nomadic pathology. It's a way to label someone as the nomad, right, as the outsider. That, that those sorts of things, that looking at, at that in other cultures and in our, our own past can tell us about what we're seeing now. That what, what my sense, what my anthropology has taught, taught me so far and this praxis is that vehicle residency as we see it if we compare it to past nomadic cultures or so-called nomadic cultures, we see that, that um, in this internal destabilization, internal destabilization um, and this social othering creates these, uh, in these kind of persistent environments of, this, of these constraints can actually create internally separated cultures so that these cultures become distinct from the, their neighbors around them because they're so socially isolated yeah. that they're just constantly pushed out. And the Irish travelers are a great example. For 500 years, this was pushed and pushed and pushed until actually last year, they, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but there was a, they had a genetic test done that showed that, uh, that they were able to officially show that they were genetically distinct from the rest of the Irish people, even though they were descended from them, right? So it's kind of interesting to mm -hmm. think about like that, that 500 years of social, is so social isolation and intermarriage because of that social isolation, of yeah. course, um, created this, you know, uh, arguably genetically distinct population. And, and I, through analogy, look at that and say, what does that tell us about what we're seeing right now? Right, that what we're seeing right now, I believe is that initial dispossession point. It's that origin story of how the Irish travelers became the travelers, right? It is that it's evictions, it's changes in labor markets, it's people being unable to afford the ability to stay in the city, and then they become displaced and live on the sides of the roads.
right? And then the technologies shift and they move from being in a tent into a vehicle because it's a lot better option, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that's what we're seeing now. And I, and, and it's, um, I think that it's something that, uh, again, from like that Praxis look, that, that thinking about uh, what that, that may tell us about our lived reality is, um, is something that we should be really concerned about um, as a society. I, I uh, uh, y you know, there, there, there's uh, uh, this idea that, that nomadic, nomadic behaviors are an existential threat to settled life. Um, and I think there's some truth in that, in that, uh, that nomadic life needs this um, open, non-bordered world so that they can move, so people can move throughout that world to collect the resources they need when they need them uh, because, because it's a non-extractive form. It's, it's what's, what um, uh, Anatoly Kozinov uh, called, a, called a productive form, that he said that it was, it was uh, that uh, nomadism is, is saying there's not food here so I gotta go over there to produce it. Right, to find new forms, mm -hmm. whereas the settled world extracts it from that thing, right? Mm -hmm. so, so if we are living in this settled world of this extractive form and people are moving towards this nomadic form, that means that you have a group of people that no longer see borders, that people that move freely pl places to be, to be able to get move, have to move uh, widely to be able to get the resources they need and become even more further destabilized by that. And if we actually, you know, sort of op operationalize that, what does that mean in reality to now? You're talking, you know, 3,000 RVs moving city to city, right? Uh, our country is not prepared for that. Um, the United States doesn't have the infrastructure. Uh, we don't have the social services developed for that. And arguably, I would say that, you know, that, that as I've already shown in my research so far, that sort of thing perpetuates itself and becomes more and more and more and if we go down that route, it, it, it's, it leads to further instability. So this is where I really think we need to head that off at the pass. We need to really focus on how can we find ways to settle this population, to stabilize this population before we are looking at this new American traveler. You know, and um, yeah. yeah. That was such a good synthesis of what we talked about in your research, I feel very, enlightened about what's going on in the world and especially in the United States. And I feel very enlightened about what's happened in throughout the history of nomadic people. And I feel as though it's, it is, uh, in some ways it is a, it's a desperate time that, uh, and we need to put the measures together to um, prevent further displacement and to um, put together the, the relief and development, the settlement and skills that are needed to, to solve this and, yeah. um, and, and get, drop, drop the them and the they and get to the we and the us. And yeah, yeah it's, it's such a pleasure talking to you yeah. about all it, this, Graham. And, and if I could end on a positive note on that, I, I think that there, that there is a positivity in all this. I think that, that we need, that we can see that it's these change. Experience. Well, it is a learning experience and there's things that we can take from this, but that even beyond that, I really love this idea of creative destruction, of, um, of uh, make, you know, doing rid of, getting rid of what's not working to make space, to use those resources to build up what is working. Um, uh, I don't know if you know the, the story of 3M, right? Of them using that uh, every year they go and they take 15% of their products off the line, right? And they take no matter what, they take 15% and they take all that, that money and they put it into R&D to build up what is working even better, mm. right? And I like to think of that, these sorts of moments of um, crisis that we experience, of change, <coughs> are opportunities for us to reimagine the future. Right? These are breaking points where we actually have an opportunity to break from the past to say, you know, we are not um, cursed to relive the lives of our ancestors. We are not, we do not need to build futures on our grandfather's bones, right? We can build a new reality and we can learn from these things to have a world that is more equitable, that, 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 that has processes that don't create these inequalities. So. Imagine if we took that 3M model and we applied it to everything in life. Take the 15% of things that aren't working in civilization yeah. and invest that into 15% into R&D for what is working in civilization and keep yeah. moving keep the ball making forward. making it better. Yeah, I think we do a good amount of that right now, but, um, but we definitely need to think about that more often as, as an integral part of 
of what we do because I think there is a tremendous amount of complacency at times with the, the way things are. And I think it's very interesting that entrepreneurs or artists or people that are just basically unsatisfied with the current paradigm of the world are the ones that go like, nah, -uh, we got to change that shit. And that's then right. they're the ones that go and just build it and do that's it. Right. And that's why we love talking to people like you and to people that are um, building the future and talking about the important research that you're doing and, and and, you know, I really recommend everybody um, to take a look at, at Graham's work. Check it out in the bio. Also, check out WeCount.org. Um, much love, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. Graham, thanks for joining us on the it's show. It's a pleasure. It's Thank you so much. It's been super fun. It was awesome. It yeah. was really great meeting you. I've loved our conversation. It's been awesome. Me too. Me awesome. too. Yeah. I'm love so it. happy we <laughs> met a couple nights ago. Absolutely. And <laughs> everyone, check out the work. Also, give us your comments. We'd love to hear from you in the comments below. Let us know what you think about the episode. Um, Go and do your own investigations into vehicle residencies and into mm -hmm. people um, that are without home and go and talk to them. Go check out our episodes that we've done on Street Life um, before in Street Smarts. Mm -hmm. Go check out those episodes and see yeah. what we're talking about. And talk with the service providers and how you can help them. Yeah, talk with service providers, how you can help them. Pass a little, pass some of your time actually going and volunteering time to, yeah. to these efforts to, um, to humanize ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. And also go and manifest your dreams into the world. Build the future. Thanks to AAA, uh, the American Anthropological Association's annual meeting. This has been super fun down in San Jose. Thanks, everyone, and much love. See you soon. Peace. That's great. Wow. Man, love it. Yeah. Really a lot that, of fun. That, thank you. <laughs>